Okay, the uh, room moderators are me, Hal Langford, and our co-moderator is Tina Smith. She's over there. Hathorne. Tina Hathorne. Tina Hathorne. I, You're I, supposed to change the name in the blank. Oh, okay. <laughs> and our Zoom moderators are Michael Waller and John Marks. Uh, 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 Michael is on the, on the deal there. And uh, now, let me go to the script. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Scholar Day at A. We are so excited to have you with us today, both in person and over Zoom. Uh, my name is Hal Langford, and I am the, uh, a professor in the College of Business, and I'll be serving as your moderator today. Hey, everyone. Um, as Dr. Langford said, my name is Michael Waller. I'm the systems administration librarian here at the Bolton Library, and I'm going to be serving as your Zoom moderator today. My name's John Marks. I'm going to be backing everybody up. That's cool. Thank you, John. Um, Uh, if, you, if, you, if you have not already done so, please complete the sign-in form located in the comment of the chat feature. If you cannot locate the sign-in sheet, it is also available on the Scholar Day webpage. Before we begin, please note this session will be recorded. <clears throat> I am pushing the record button now. Actually, that's me, Hal. I got it. Okay, thank you. I'm glad to know that. Yeah. It's all right. We're good. Okay. Uh, if you have uh, all online attendees will be muted throughout the presentation. If you have questions for the participant, please write them in the chat feature and we will re read them to the presenters at the end of their presentation. Oh, that was your deal. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, it was, but that's fine. I'm going to let you roll with it because you're very confident and knowledgeable. So you're just owning that script. Um, so I'll make sure and step in if there's any functions I need to do, but you're good. <laughs> And let us all remember that I'm part ham actor. Okay. In this, in this, uh, in this session, you'll be hearing from uh, Ashley Burrell, Matthew Collins, Cody Morgan, Allison Daigle, Lori Lopez, and Trang Watson. Uh, each student will have nine minutes to present, then three minutes to answer questions. Judges, I will also be providing you with a participant ID number, which you will go at the top of your judging form. Let's begin first with uh, Ashley Burrell, presenting her work uh, on a community center in um, San Antonio, Texas. Judges, please note the participants, participants I need to number for your form is 800. Good morning, everyone. Can you all hear me? Awesome. Hey, <laughs> welcome to Scholar Day. Um, as Professor Langford said, my name is Ashley Burrell. Um, I'm currently in the Lone Star State, so I'm waving to everyone in the boot right now. My family is actually from Monroe, so I'm very familiar with the state and actually love it. Um, as he was stating, my presentation today is going to be on a project that is very dear to my heart. It's something I'm extremely passionate about. And with the help of LSUA, and the um, business department, I have been able to start moving this project in the right direction with my actual business plan and my elevator pitch. So to give you some background information, um, about 10 years ago, I actually started working in collegiate athletics. I have always been an athlete, always been in sports, so I've always had a passion for it. It wasn't until when I worked for Northern Illinois University in their media relations department that I was able to actually see what putting together a athletic program actually entails. So my very first day on the job, I go to a college basketball game and I'm not in the stands for the first time. I'm behind everything. I'm on the floor. I'm talking to the media. I'm talking to the NBA. I'm interviewing the athletes and I completely fall in love. So fast forward, I moved from the Chicagoland area to Texas and become a youth sports director. 
that's where the nail was finally in the coffin. When they tell you you can't have everything in one job, they're lying. <laughs> I was able to work as a youth sports director over a thousand kids each season, all of their coaches, babysitting their parents, um, putting on all these different events. And that's what prompted me for the idea of my actual community center. Something that's really important to me is our youth um, sports and the actual community. Being able to have one facility that encompasses, encompasses all of these different things into one is gonna be something that San Antonio desperately needs and that our youth can actually utilize. So without further ado, because a lot of this information is gonna be presented to you here shortly, I'm going to be presenting to you my elevator pitch on what I like to call the Prestige Civic Center. So let me share that with you all now. If it's sharing. So while we're waiting for this to share. <laughs> okay. All right. One moment as this pulls up. This is the part we didn't get to practice very much. Yeah, we didn't get to practices, but it's fine. It's going to work. Ashley, just go ahead and talk about your project. Yeah, absolutely. So my project, the Prestige Civic Center, is going to be a 42,000 square foot facility where we will be able to actually host uh, community events, youth basketball tournaments. Um, as some of you are aware, we actually had the NCAA Final Four tournament. It's actually San Antonio is actually one of the number one locations that they actually utilize for these different things. So that is what the actual center will be um, encompassing. On top of the sports, what we can also be utilizing the actual center for would be community service uh, organizations. A lot of times they don't have the ability to actually um, have the space to actually show the actual um, facility, the facility itself. So they, what they'd be using, they'd be able to rent it out the facility for like corporate events or um, any of the events that they actually have. So for some reason, this is not shown. All right, give me two seconds. All right, and I'm just gonna hop into another screen really fast. So that way I can actually show you guys what um, the elevator pitch is. So you guys can all see what we will be talking about. Okay, Ashley, I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, ask you your first question, okay? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, come back, come back, uh, come back live here for a second. Um, actually, I just connected, so okay. let's see. Are you able to hear me? You're getting a little bit of feedback, Ashley, on your mic. Is that better? Yes, it is. Okay, perfect. Now let's share the actual elevator pitch. Okay, we have about two minutes and 30 seconds perfect. left.
Turn on your microphone. I am talking about sports, more specifically, youth sports. Currently, as it stands, the youth sports industry is valued at over $19.2 billion, only second to the NFL. It's crazy, right? With your help, we can be a part of this growing industry by investing into the Prestige Civic Center. Starting with over 20,000 square feet and even more room to expand, the Civic Center is already estimated to bring in over $300,000 per year. With its premier location in San Antonio, Texas, it is the perfect site for city and statewide sporting events, the NCAA Final Four Tournament, youth leagues, and a variety of other events as well. With anything in the sports world, the impact goes beyond our respective playing fields. This Civic Center will serve as a safe haven for our youth and also a mentoring program. It will also be a staple in the community, offering resources such as GED programs and many more to the underprivileged. I believe wholeheartedly that the youth are our future. It takes a community to build a village, and with your help, we can build this village. Please visit us at www.thegwproject.com to see how you can become a part of this prestigious opportunity. Thank you so much for your time, and enjoy the rest of your day. Perfect. I hope you guys are all able to hear and see that. Were you guys able to see that and hear that? Yes. Thank okay, you. perfect. Um, I just want to say that I had a MacBook and I'm definitely Apple all the way and Windows. So there we go. <laughs> we fixed it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. We appreciate it. Uh, we're going we're gonna to forego questions with this one. And okay. we're going to go to our next presenter. And our next presenter is, um, is uh, Matthew Collins. And uh, I assume that Matthew's out there someplace. Matthew, I'm right here. Okay, good. Matthew, Matthew's going to talk about challenge, challenges, and sustainability in social entrepreneurship. Hey guys, my name is Matthew Collins. I'm from Opelousas, Louisiana. Um, I first off, I really want to talk about what is social entrepreneurship, right? So to get to it, um, social entrepreneurship is an entrepreneur seeing a social problem and fixing it, um, whether that be uh, education, uh, environmental, health and labor conditions, and human rights. Um, for my particular project, I focus more on um, social cultural. So more pertaining on the human aspect of it, um, you know, hunger and, um, and, and race and education. I feel like that was what I really want to focus in on. Um, but really what I really want to focus on was the um, challenges and sustainability. So what are some of the challenges that we face in uh, social entrepreneurship? Uh, first off, I would like to talk about in our current society with COVID-19, um, you know, working remotely. Just recently, we were able to actually access uh, or be more available to see each other in person. A lot of our business went online. Uh, which makes it harder for us to go and see people and actually operate our business correctly. Another thing uh, is getting funds, right? So uh, a lot of these uh, social entrepreneurships, these companies are, um, they're, they're nonprofit, you know, and how are we going to go and get these funds for um, these nonprofits? Well, so there's certain ways we can do this, whether that be sponsorships, uh, we can do that by grants, donations, uh, and, you know, uh, sponsoring events. Um, now, another challenge that we see is through our competition. Uh, not only is the nonprofit, um, well, a lot of these are nonprofit, uh, we also have competition, um, you know, right down the street. So think about that as nonprofit. It's, it's a very hard industry to go in uh, and be successful in. Um, you know, another thing that we need to work on is uh, getting skilled workers. Uh, I think that goes hand in hand with, uh, with it being a nonprofit organization because the funding is typically not as, uh, as high as another place. So why would a skilled worker come to your nonprofit uh, other than going to a different company where they can get paid more? Um, so some, those are some of the challenges that you see in a, non, in a social entrepreneurship. Um, I think uh, it's important to look at um, sustainability now. I mean, how are we gonna keep this company afloat? Um, and there's two things I would like to look at when you look at sustainability. Um, and that is, what is your social goal? You know, what is the social goal of your, um, of your social entrepreneurship company? Um, you know, is it to um, combat, you know, um, world hunger? Is it to uh, promote education? Um, that is 
the sole purpose of your company that should be you know are you are you um, promoting that company? Uh, another thing you need to look at whenever you're trying to look at sustainability with that company is the um, is to have it financially stable. Uh, and there's only a, a few things you can do but with that. And that is uh, what I listed above with some of the challenges. That's uh, getting funded. And that's that, that's the key with this uh, this kind of company is getting funded. Um, so the way to get funded is obviously through uh, your government. I mean, you can get to grants. Um, and then, like I said before, you can go ahead and get um, sponsorships with other companies. Um, and so I think those are the two things that are really important. And then also awareness of your company. I mean, if, you're, if your company's out there and nobody uh, sees it and nobody understands it, then you're not going to do well. So I feel like that's uh, extremely important whenever you're trying to get have a sustainable company is uh, awareness of your company as well. Uh, and that's, that's a broad... Um, that's kind of like an overlay of my, my paper. And if you have any questions, please go ahead and ask me. Um, Dr. Langford, I have a question in on the um, chat. Someone is asking what um, this participant's number is. This participant's uh, number is 801. 801. Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, that's all right. That. <clears throat> okay, and I do have a question for Matthew. Um, okay. I'll go ahead and start off. Um, so when you were talking about sustainability, you said that one of the factors in determining the sustainability of your venture is um, the social, the stated social goal. Can yes. you expand on that a little bit more? Or are you saying that like if the social goal is small and easy to achieve and once your goal is achieved, like you have no reason to exist or is it more complex than that? So it's a little bit more complex than that. So what I mean by that is, um, what is your social goal? Like uh, a lot of these companies, um, let's say a company is their social goal is to uh, combat hunger or world hunger or something like that. Um, you know, are they achieving this? Because that if they're not achieving that, but let's say like they're doing, um, they're profitable in some way, but they're lacking actually their main focus. You know, are they sustainable? And what they eventually, what they first came out to be, you know, their main focus was to go and combat hunger, but did they deviate to being more focused on the profitability of a company? Uh, so it's kind of like, bro that's what I was trying to get to is it's broken up kind of into two factors, sustainable and the outlook of, uh, are they achieving what they first set out to be? And then also the financial side of it. Gotcha. Uh, I have a question. Um, do you see a future for social entrepreneurship? I 100% see a future for entrepreneurship uh, and especially uh, social entrepreneurship. I mean, you look in today's world, um, it's, it's not a pretty sight. You know, there's a lot of things that you can fix, uh, whether it be world hunger, um, whether that be uh, human rights. There's always an opportunity to do that. Um, I feel like... Um, there's certain ways you can go around it. It's definitely taking a risk because um, every company is a risk, but I feel like social entrepreneurship takes on a whole different risk when it comes to profitability and, um, you know, and what's your main purpose. Um, but I definitely believe that there's a future for it. And I believe that, um, I believe that there's some good people out there that can solve this problem. Are there any more questions from the audience? Dr. Lashney. How would a company, company measure its success in whatever project they're, they're doing? It's, For example, you mentioned uh, hunger, world hunger. How would a company determine they've been successful in meeting their goals and objectives to make progress in that area? Did you I'm hear sorry, I can, I can barely hear. Okay, he asked, how do you measure your success? If your goal, for example, is <clears throat> combating world hunger, how do you measure the success you're having in combating world hunger? So the way you come, you, you can go and track this by, uh, you have to have this technology for today. Um, the technology for today, you can go and see, you know, the, prop, the money that you achieve, that you get from um, sponsorships, the money that you get from grants, 
you can see how much food you're producing, or you can see how much food you're shipping out to different places um, in any community. Uh, and you can see how much of an effect you're actually putting on that community. Um, and I would say the number one way you can track that is through our computer systems today. Uh, like I was saying, it's just understanding, it's, it, it, it's seeing what's going out uh, and who's being affected by it. So obviously if, if a lot of your funds are going towards, um, you know, your people's paychecks or um, sponsorships or something like that, rather than going straight to the, the product or the service that you're trying to uh, go towards, then um, that's the problem. But um, the best way of tracking that is seeing where your funds are going out there or being allocated to. Um, and if they're not being allocated in the right direction, then you know where the problem's at. Okay, uh, Matthew, thank you very much. We appreciate it. You did a good job, buddy. I, I appreciate that. That's no problem. And let's see, next on our list is uh, Cody Morgan. And Cody Morgan is going to uh, talk about social entrepreneurship as well. Uh, it seems to be a, uh, uh, a, a popular topic. In fact, it was a popular topic because that's what my, um, my uh, uh, research class was about this past semester is social entrepreneurship. So uh, Cody, are you there? And Cody is number 802. Uh, let's see. I don't see Cody on the okay. uh, list of participants anywhere. Okay, he he actually is. Uh, let me let me skip him because he's calling in on his lunch hour, and we're a little ahead of where his lunch hour is. So he will be there in just a minute. Okay, okay. so we're going to skip down next to number eight hundred three which is Allison Daigle, and I see her there. Hi, Allison, how are you today? Hi, Dr. Langford, I'm good. Good, and guess what? She's gonna talk about social <laughs> entrepreneurship, the environment. So, um, uh, Allison, uh, she is number 803, take it away. Hi everyone, my name is Allison Daigle and I live in Eunice, Louisiana. This is currently my second semester here at LSUA and today I'm going to be talking to you about social entrepreneurship and how it affects the environment. Have you ever thought about the small businesses or the major companies that tend to go out of their way in order to promote environmental friendly activities? What about the companies or the businesses that have outreach programs that they donate to, created, or even sponsored. Have you ever wondered why they do this? Or maybe that you just thought their managers and founders were just really great people that incorporated their personal ethics into their businesses. However, it turns out that social entrepreneurship is a concept that has actually been in the business world for many, many years. Social entrepreneurship is defined as being the process of employing a market-based method in order to help solve social issues or problems in the world. These problems could be social or environmental issues. They focus on all topics. Research on social entrepreneurship has recently become more popular over the years. Companies and small businesses stay on top of their social entrepreneurship actions and the results it has by realizing and monitoring their social responsibility plan. This is a plan that outlines the steps and the accomplishments that a company has had and taken in the business world in order to solve problems. The overall need for social entrepreneurship is undeniable. We all have something in the world that we can do or help in a little way to make it better. The world is by far not perfect. In no means does anybody think it is. We can all help to make it better at all times. It is common that the social entrepreneurships or college students, this is most likely due to the fulfillment that it offers, the, act the activities it can incorporate, 
and the employment ability that it has. Everyone wants that fulfillment in life. Everybody tries to find something that makes them feel whole and accomplished. Social entrepreneurship allows people to help others and give you a sense of pride and joy that is undeniable. The active citizenship allows you to be part of your community, even if you are from a new area. If you have traveled for college, if you have traveled for work, or even if you just moved to a new state or country. The employment ability is just undeniable. We all need a job to help us in life and do what we want to do. Social entrepreneurship also has many benefits for the business or the company that it is implementing, that is implementing it. The first benefit that a company or business receives from it is good publicity. Everyone wants their company to be seen as a great founder, a great community, same as everyone wants to be seen as a nice and genuine person. Tom's Shoe Company is a great example of this. They have given back to their community in so many ways through social entrepreneurship. Many companies focus on the environment whenever they begin social entrepreneurship. They do this by changing their uh, production processes to release less harmful chemicals into the at, uh, atmosphere. They switch to eco-friendly products. Sometimes they even change their companies to use more recycled products. Social entrepreneurship is a very popular concept in the business world, regardless of its newfound popularity across the globe. For many years, society and the environment of all all around the world have been the ben have been receiving the benefits of social entrepreneurship. This will continue to be the case in most countries and as people around the world begin to implement it more into their daily lives. I discuss this as well as many other topics that relate to social entrepreneurship in more detail throughout my paper. I encourage all of you to read it in order to learn more about the social entrepreneurship and the effects it has on the environment as well as the world. Thank y'all. Questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. Can I have a question? Yeah. Um, and if you could restate it possibly. It, it would appear that a major corporation have more opportunity to participate in social responsibility, entrepreneurship, and the environment. What are one or two ways small businesses, which that's the majority of the businesses we have, what are one or two ways a small business could, could contribute to, to this very important effort? Did you, did you, could you hear that? Yes, I could. Okay, shoot. Small, small businesses do have a great opportunity to incorporate social entrepreneurship also. While large companies may do it on a bigger scale that are more showy, small businesses can donate to local programs such as sports programs or any youth programs that they have in order to help children that have poor education, maybe a rough home life, just any social act that will make a difference in a child's life, give them a new point of view, help them feel a part of the community and improve their life, which in return will have a long-term effect on the world. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Um, Allison, um, could you explain how Tom's is, uh, is an example or why it's an example of a social entrepreneurship? Yes, sir. Tom's is a shoe company that is that donates a pair every time somebody buys a shoe. They donate a pair to a child or a family or a person that would not have been able to purchase shoes that may, that would help them in their life. So every time you buy a shoe, Tom donates a shoe to somebody else. They focus mainly on their donations, which is why they are a great example of a company that is helping with social entrepreneurship. Okay, do we have any more questions? Uh, yes, there is a question from someone online in the chat, and it reads, is there a good resource for people to go to on the internet for learning more on how to get started doing something like this? Yes, there's a many great resources on the internet. Um, the best one I have found has been going through the LSUA library and looking at the scholar uh, 
revised papers. That's the ones that I use the most. I thought they were very insightful and very informative. Thank you for that. That was uh, that was not even rehearsed. <laughs> yeah, that was almost fine. <laughs> Other questions? Okay, thank you, Allison. You did a great job. Thank you. Okay, uh, let me check real quick to see if uh, uh, Mr. Collins is here yet. And uh, Cody Morgan's still not here. Okay, so next we go to uh, um, number 804. And that's uh, Lori Lopez. And uh, Lori is in Enterprise, Alabama. Uh, she's a student of ours. And uh, she's going to talk about a business plan that she presented to me uh, for uh, one of my entrepreneurship classes. And uh, she'll get into that a little bit. So uh, Lori, unmute and take off. Hello, my name is Lori Lopez, and I am presenting a business idea for a popcorn shop, a boutique popcorn shop. And I will also be showing you my elevator pitch, which my kids got involved in, so it was a lot of fun to make. So if you've never been to a boutique popcorn shop, it's, uh, it's not just your buttered popcorn. You can go in, and there are so many different flavors, like brownie batter and cake and dill pickle and Cajun and buffalo wing. So I really like the concept of having a lot of different flavors to please a lot of different people. And like you said, I'm in Enterprise, Alabama. I grew up here, it's a small town. We have the Bull Weevil Monument in the middle of Main Street. And so the name is a shout out to the Bull Weevil Monument. That's why it's spelled the popcorn bowl, B-O-L-L, -L, instead of B-O-W-L. They have been renovating the entire Main Street area. They have festivals about once a month, but there's something missing all the time. And that is a place to stop, to relax, to get a snack. And if you're already shopping at the boutiques, you don't wanna spend a lot of money on a snack. So I was thinking popcorn is the perfect affordable snack. It's not too messy. You can carry it with you. You don't have to heat it. So that's how I ended up with popcorn and my children always want a place to stop and get a snack. I want a place to get a snack. And these downtown festivals are a good place to present this as well. So it's convenient. You can have different pricing. You can have different sizes. You can let people mix and match. So everyone will be happy with what they get. And then to take it a step further, I wanted to also offer the popcorn for different, which it kind of goes with the social entrepreneurship for different programs where they can personalize it, where they can do flavors to fit the junior college or the high school and to do fundraisers and different activities that could actually help the community as well. My family has had businesses in enterprise before. My grandfather had a feed store. His father had a feed store as well. And so I'm used to the business environment myself. And I think, let me see. Some of the things that we've looked at with flavors is allowing people to create for birthdays and weddings as well, to do it themed to go with whatever their decision is on that. Um, so that will be a lot of fun as well. And I'm talking way too fast, but I think I'll go ahead and show you my video and then I can add to it if I need to go after that, okay? So let's see if I can get this. Mom, she's always shopping. She takes so long. She's boring, hungry, mm -hmm. and a snack. Ew. I wish there was somewhere downtown that we could just, you know, sit and hang out. I'm so hungry. My feet hurt. I'm tired. What's that? I don't know. Let's see. Ah, uh, the popcorn bowl. That's interesting. Let's go see what they have. so much. This is great. Yes, I love this buffalo wing popcorn flavor. This brownie batter is great. It was so nice to be able to sit down and relax while mom spent all her time shopping all yeah, day. Yeah, she could shop all day. 
Yeah, I'm going to invite my friends here. Cool. Good plan. Americans consume 17 billion quarts of popcorn a year. My name is Lori Lopez and I have a business called The Popcorn Bowl. It's a gourmet popcorn shop. There are currently 15 flavors, but we're always thinking of new ones. Some of our most popular flavors are the brownie batter and the buffalo wing. We also have cookie dough, birthday cake, cherry cheesecake, taco, pickle and cheeseburger popcorn. And then for the classics, we do have buttered and plain popcorn. I would like for you to invest $50,000 in my business to help us grow and expand, set up Main Street locations, and also add an additional website. The website idea is to take a small town business and share some of the love that we share with each other, with the world. Mr. Langford, I put my 50,000 in, now it's your turn. Partner with me and let's get popping. Okay. Uh, Lori, let me ask you first off, have we started this business yet? Not yet. I'm trying to finish school first. <laughs> okay, tell us when you when do you plan to graduate? I will graduate in August. What year? This year. Oh, okay. I'm just, <laughs> just making sure. Okay. Yeah. And so soon after that, you're planning to do the uh, to do the uh, uh, popcorn shop, the popcorn bowl. I really honestly am because they have renovated about four more locations downtown and made all new storefronts. So it's been, they're really trying to help it grow. It's a really great space to do it too. Okay. Um, uh, let me throw open the uh, opportunity for questions to our audience here. That many. I have a question. Yeah, I, I knew Dr. Dr. Lashley would have a question. Go ahead. Made me hungry. This all sounds great. <laughs> my, my comment is that you talked about morphing your product in a lot of different venues. Have you considered adding to, to the physical location, uh, I'll call it a food truck, a motor truck, where you could actually travel to different portals and, and other areas uh, that you like to service? I have considered that in our city is actually very difficult to have a food truck because of the fire licensing that you have to get. You have to have the fire department come check every location. But I have looked into the prospect of having personalized bags where we could take the bagged products to different locations to sell. And we do have a nut shop on Main Street that sells other items. And we have an ice cream shop that I was thinking they maybe could make a popcorn flavor out a popcorn flavored ice cream, which might be fun. So I have considered bagging it to take to different locations, but the food truck wouldn't really work just because of the laws here. I understand, great, great answer. Okay, are there any other questions? Michael, do we have any in the, uh, in, in the, uh, chat, in the chat room? Uh, yes, we have something. Um... Looks like Laura Carroll is asking, have you considered franchising later on? I have considered that. Um, one of the things that I didn't mention earlier was that I wanted it to be a very personalized location. The decor and everything should be very personal. So I've considered franchising, but I would like to keep it in small downtown locations and personalize it to each city. Kind of like the Chewy's aspect where each one is personalized to the location. So that's really the feel that I would want is for it to feel like a hometown and not a franchise. I got a question in the back, please. Uh, how would you be competitive with like more established specialty popcorn companies like Popcornopolis or Funky Chunky or something like that? I think the main thing would be the personalization. Like we have a junior college here with the bull weevils. So we would probably have a green popcorn that we could sell for their events. And then we have the Wildcats with their blue and white. So having coordinating popcorns to go with that. I think the difference would be the personalization that we would have and the connection to the people. Other questions? Uh, yes, I have a question. Um, do you have any estimates on how much you would have to spend on marketing and graphic design? This seems like a business that would really want to stand out with you know, storefront imaging, uh, especially when you're talking about different customization options. Anything that has boutique in the label, it seems to lean heavily on some marketing and graphic design. So do you have a percentage of your initial outlay that would go towards um, purely marketing? 
I haven't had to consider a lot of that because there is an entire organization in enterprise, the downtown group that is marketing downtown. If you join the chamber of commerce for them, they will market. And there's also an art shop and they paint on the windows and it's a few hundred dollars each time they paint each quarter. So that's really how most of the main street businesses are marketing is with the window paintings from the local artists. Oh, great. Any other questions for Lori? Thank you, Lori. By the way, by the way, here's 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 a little here's a little tip for you. So, where are you going Saturday, Lori? It's going to rain again. <laughs> oh, Lori I'm not going only, to the beach. <laughs> Lori lives only about an hour and a half from the beach, so I. Uh, I planned it. I want to see if I can sell my popcorn at the beach next. Okay, that good idea. Great. Good <laughs> idea. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. All right. Um, our next participant is participant number 805, Trang Watts, uh, Watson, and she's going to talk about Vietnam, the emerging global textile manufacturer during a global pandemic. Uh, Dr. Langford, just really quick, sorry to interrupt. Um, I know you wanted to try and offer Cody a presentation spot around noon. Yeah. Um, and I believe he has joined us now. Okay, so Trang, hang on, okay? Sorry, Trang. Okay. All right, so next will be Cody Morgan talking about social entrepreneurship. Cody, go. All right, so... Um, I wrote a paper on social entrepreneurship. Um, before I wrote this paper, um, I honestly had no idea what social entrepreneurship was. Um, I know what an entrepreneur is. And um, before really diving into that, I, I really only thought about money. Um, so it was a pleasant surprise when I was doing this paper um, to learn exactly what a social entrepreneur is. Um, they define it as an approach by individuals to implement social, cultural, um, or envi environmental change. Um, do, do these social, social entrepreneurs make money? That all depends. Um, their main goal um, is to show their stockholders and their investors um, that they are uh, making a promise that, that they will create a change. Um, this can be anything from a uh, change in the environment um, helping uh, bring social change, uh, whether that be in this country or globally. Um, some of the entrepreneurs um, that have made social changes that really uh, came to mind when I was writing this paper um, is Bill Gates. Um, though he makes um, a great amount of money on the things um, and the endeavors that he's had, um, he does have a foundation um, that helps bring um, change to not only his community, um, but to the world. Um, another one dating a little farther back is uh, John D. Rockefeller. Um, at the time when um, oil was booming and, and he was making his money, he uh, quickly in his old age um, decided to become a philanthropist um, and really use that money to help bring change. Um, those two aspects are a little different than what um, comes to mind of a social entrepreneur. Um, a social entrepreneur creates a business model and that business model is not always to make money. Obviously you have to make money to stay in business, but the main goal is to, is to bring change to society in whatever ways that, that they are looking to do so. Um, helping others is at the forefront of a social entrepreneur's mind. Um, anything they can do um, to help out um, their fellow man or woman. Um, uh, social entrepreneurship, um, while doing my paper, um, dates back to 1953. Um, a gentleman named H. Bowen uh, wrote Social Responsibilities of the Businessman. And that's kind of where we, we first got the idea of, of actually being socially responsible um, for what you're trying to do. It wasn't until the 80s and 90s that Mr. Bill Drayton um, helped with um, service organizations at Yale and Harvard. Um, and Mr. Bill Drayton was really your um, first mainstream social entrepreneur. Um, so while writing this paper, uh, I learned a lot uh, about social entrepreneurs. Um, the difference between them and just an entrepreneur is, is vast. Um, 
if someone's really trying to bring social change and really trying to implement a different culture um, to help others, um, while also uh, making a profit is, is, is intriguing. And I, I definitely learned a lot from this paper. Do we have some questions? Oh, I knew, I knew soon enough I would see Dr. Lashney take off his mask. Go for it. Hello. How would you attract, attract investors? Uh, in other words, uh, clearly the objective is not to make money in your business uh, when you're supporting one of the causes you talk about. So, so they would have to share a common goal with the, the mission of the company. But let's look beyond that. How would you go about attracting investors, shareholders, to invest into your company or the type of company you're describing? Um, so, so for example, um, one one of the one of the things that comes to mind when you ask that question is, um, in in today's society, we're seeing a great uh, a great deal of change in the automobile industry, um, whether that's uh, leaving from the the old. Um, ways that we're doing so to brand new energy efficient vehicles um, that may not be harming this planet. Um, so while the investors may not have been um, ones that say I was I was doing um, an energy efficient car, I may have not used those previous investors, but the way that um, the world is changing before our eyes, um, those same investors that invested previously may be looking to change um, Kind of the way the world is, um, so that that's one of the ways is is finding people that not only have been doing it but want to change with me, um, but also finding um, companies that are just hardcore for the environment, um, people that that want to change the way we are polluting our world, um, and that's in an example of of um, energy efficient cars. If that's what I was going to do. Thank you. Other questions. Uh, by the way, Cody's number is 802. So uh, those of you who need that for your stuff, Cody's number is 802. Cody, thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the drive back from Lake Charles. It's always good to be leaving Lake Charles. Yes, sir. Happiness is Lake Charles in my rearview mirror. I, I, won't, I won't start singing. Yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Our next uh, participant, number 805, uh, that we have, uh, <clears throat> I've already introduced once, but I'll introduce again, is Trang Watson and her pipe paper is entitled Vietnam, the Emerging Global Textile Manufacturer During a Global Pandemic. Trang, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Lankford. I'm going to share a presentation, my elevator pitch. Can everybody see? Yes. Okay, great. Let me fix the screen. So, um, hello everyone. My name is Trang Watson. And as Dr. Lankford said, I am presenting my research paper, Vietnam, the Emerging Global Textile Manufacturer During a Global Pandemic. Um, my research was done for Dr. Lankford's introduction to operational management class, which really dives deep into operational excellence, business management, and effective supply chain management within the enterprise business organization. So Vietnam is a one-party communist nation state. It is one of Southeast Asia's fastest growing economy. In 2020, if you can believe it or not, it outgrew the GDP of China. When we think of Vietnam, we think of a really war-torn, battle-drawn country with, you know, locked in a decade of war with countless loss of life, or we can be nostalgic and think of an Oliver Stone mega-produced Hollywood movie such as Platoon or Born on the Fourth of July that focuses on Vietnam's history, legacy, its beauty, and its people. When we think of Vietnam, we think of infinite rice fields that ebb and flow with the land. What we don't recognize is a country that is modernized and urbanized from north to south. 
as we all know, 2020, the world, the entire world was suffering from COVID-19 pandemic. In response to that pandemic, Vietnam's government created a national and uniform pandemic response. They focused on targeted tracing, contact tracing, um, isolation of suspected COVID cases. They really clamped down um, as part of this pandemic crisis mode. And it really affected uh, the outcome of the economy. It helped the economy recover faster. Um, there was less death rates and infection rates on a per capita basis in the country. And as you can see, what happened was because of the government is a nationalistic communist government, um, you know, they created a uniformed response um, across the country. It wasn't, it wasn't a re response to cause manic crisis or panic, it was a response more in, in line with, this is a national duty. It is not a civil liberty infringement or a self-freedom uh, infraction where the government is taking your freedom from you. And with that national response, Vietnam became one of the fastest growing economy in 2020. According to the IMF, Vietnam's GDP expanded by 2.9%. It was the only Southeast Asian country to have GDP expansion, even over China. And Vietnam has been growing exponentially. It's been the global and textile leader um, within the past few years. The US is actually Vietnam's number one partner for garment, apparel, and textile exportation. As countries across the world look for alternatives in manufacturing, they look towards Vietnam to be the alternative manufacturing um, apart from China. Of course, you know, the, you, we always have to think about the 800 pound gorilla in the room, but I believe that Vietnam's future is bright with the foundation that the government is implementing across the country, um, the way they operate manufacturing. Um, a lot of factors produce, uh, a lot of factors help they navigate their growth, such as multilateral free trade agreements, low labor costs, and foreign direct investments. Um, I think just move, <laughs> there was some feedback here. Um, in 2020, Vietnam's operations in their manufacturing industry pivoted from creating clothing and garments to PPE wear. I'm going to give you some facts that will really just be amazing of how this little country in Southeast Asia operates. By the end of April 2020, when the COVID pandemic hit, Vietnam produced 415 face masks it exported across the world. Local manufacturing in the country produced has a capacity of 40 million face masks per day or about 1.2 billion per month. If the government was to take the entire operation from north to south of all of the manufacturing garment and textile industry, they can produce 100 million face masks a day or 3 billion face masks a month if they were to turn off the light on of all the operational manufacturing textile industry in the country. And with that, I believe the opportunity is bright and I look forward to my Adidas shoes and Louis Vuittons being made in Vietnam. Thank you. We have some questions for Trang. Oh, come on, Dr. Lashney. I, I, I'm depending on you. Okay. What do you think would be the, the state of the economy if the pandemic had not come through? In other words, it, it seemed to have really assisted the growth of, of Vietnam. Was it on an upward trend already? Was it, was it flat? Was it downward? Okay, great. Um, so I believe that the government actually laid the foundation for a roadmap of success. I think for the past 10 years, Vietnam has been uh, going through a transformation of kind of an FDR-esque industrial revolution. 
they focused on the infrastructure of the company. What they did was they adopted um, ecotourism for one side of the country, and then they invested in manufacturing facilities, infrastructure, way to de deliver these products within the other side of the country, which is landlocked. Um, so both sides of the economy where you have manufacturing on one side, and then you have ecotourism, uh, a booming, you know, lively, industrialized um, country, countryside on one side. So uh, a lot of that was kind of the melting pot and the, the, Senate, the genesis for Vietnam recovering from the war. So I believe that even though it is a socialistic communist country, they believe in social equity. They believe in uh, being able to raise the standard of liv living for everyone in the country and not just for few. So their investments um, in the past decade have been focused on creating jobs, creating industry, creating manufacturing, um, clamping down on kind of the illegal stuff that you know people would think about a communist country. Um, so a lot of adoption of Western theories and methodologies really helped the industrial industry uh, be where it's at today. And I think that also their COVID response was very um, direct and strict. Um, from my research, I found that Vietnam was one of the first country to effectively manage and halt the SARS spread back in 2003. So their experience repeats itself. And you know, you, the US isn't very experienced with global pandemics, but the Southeast Asian countries are. So they know how to react quickly without the, um, the nemesis of you know, individual and self-freedom in, invasion. Other questions? Dr. Dr. DuPont? Uh, Trang, um, textile has been uh, the factor that's led Vietnam to success in the past decade or so. What are the emerging industries that will lead Vietnam into the future? I really, I think that the emerging industry is actually AI. So Vietnam is, is really investing in advanced technology. Uh, we, they've had companies that come in and create these uh, because, you, you know, companies can't do IP in China because of the lockdown. But in Vietnam, they're, they're much more loose and adopting control of Western industries. So they're now starting to think about, you know, the AI transformation, um, the technology industry is expanding, and also socially, social um, acceptance of LGBT, uh, social acceptance of equality and, and not uh, no racism. Um, a lot of that has helped the country grow out of this kind of almost decades long uh, war recovery. Thank you. We have other questions. I, I might point out that Trang is joining us today from uh, Waxahachie, Texas. Um, another place that's good to be seeing in your rearview mirror, I've actually been to Waxahachie, Texas, so. Thank you. All right, uh, Trang, thank you so very much. Uh, I'm going to turn back over to Michael, who is going to do what he does, I think. Michael? Uh, sure, sure, that's fine. Um, that is all of our presenters, so excellent job, everyone.